Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at evolvefish.com under the partner the tab. Experience. Thank you. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at evolvefish.com under the partner the tab. Experience. Thank you. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers. <laughs> uh, oh, ouch. Loud. Man, I don't like this sound box. Hello. It works too well. Uh, <laughs> wow, I'm hearing my own voice in my ears still, and I'm hearing myself coming through really choppy through the speakers, so this is just a massive confusion. But welcome to the Atheist Experience, everybody. Uh, today is Sunday, October 18, 2015. I'm your host, Russell Glasser, and I'm here live today with Tracy Harris. Howdy. Uh, let's see. We are a live calling public access television show based in Austin, Texas, dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. Uh, we are, I said it again, <laughs> call in public access show. Aww. We are broadcasting live from the ACA studios, uh, in, in, uh, Austin. And actually today's show is kind of special because this is the first day that we've actually got Three cameras, count them, watch this, camera one. Come on, do it. Maybe that is camera one. Uh, uh, camera two, <laughs> is that camera two? <laughs> camera three? <laughs> hey. We got three whole cameras, check it out. Okay, back to camera one again. I don't control this stuff, so I'm not gonna be doing that ever again. But uh, <laughs> Clearly you don't control it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I also don't control the phone lines, which is still a change from our original location, but uh, I'm told that someday we'll be dealing with a, with a new solution. So as always, we appreciate your patience. Uh, we're available through live streaming at ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com. You can provide feedback by commenting on our show blog, freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP, or you can email us at tv at atheist-community.org. If you enjoy this show, please check out our related podcast, The Nonprofits, currently airing on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. You can find links at the Atheist Experience website, and the next nonprofits will be recorded on October 21st, when I believe the hosts will be Jeff D as usual, Dennis Lupe as usual, and Naomi Marmel taking my place because I got uh, a thing to celebrate that night. As always, the cast and crew of the Atheist Experience will be going to dinner after the show at the Threadgill's North location, 6416 North Lamar, arriving around 6 p.m. And I'm just going to fiddle with my... <laughs> oh. Uh-oh. Okay. What? Something's improved there. But uh, how are you today, Tracy? I'm doing very well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I guess I can keep talking long enough for you to keep fiddling with your thing. Um, usually at this point you would say, hey, do you have a topic today? Hey, do and you have a topic today? <laughs> and I would say, well, not a big one, but I did see something that I found interesting recently that oh, I wanted to share. Uh, while you talk about that, we're going to queue up Brandon in Orlando. Sounds good. Uh, and Brandon, if you don't know the drill yet, you're going to be on the air for a minute, but when, when we call you, then you're going to be actually ready to talk. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's... That's another thing we want to fix. <laughs> okay. Well, I dig Netflix. Like, I watch a lot of Netflix. And uh, not yet, Brandon. Hang on. <laughs> and, um, and chill. <laughs> Sorry. And I watched a special about uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. It was just this historical mm -hmm. retrospect on, on them. And it was interesting because... I actually learned some things. It's funny because you know you hear the names and they they're famous people, outlaws. Right? That's a movie. Yeah, no. Are you uh, kidding? No. 
Okay. Yes, it was a movie about Western outlaws. All right. Okay. No, they they were they were real. I Western. thought they were fictional characters. Maybe. That's no, the, they're uh, they're real people. Paul Newman and uh, wait. No, they were gun. They were okay. well. Uh, they weren't gunned down. It was that was one of the things I learned was interesting about right. it. Um, In the movie, they were. Spoiler. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's an old film, so hopefully, yeah. Yeah. there's got to be a time limit on spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. In this documentary, there were a lot of things I didn't know. It's like I knew there were outlaws, I knew train robberies and things like that, but I really didn't understand like what happened later in life with them. And apparently they moved to, I guess, Argentina and spent some time in other countries, like neighboring Argentinian countries. And uh, one of the things that happened was they were finally cornered and um, they had a shootout with lawmen and or townspeople and uh, it was like this big long all night ugly thing and then in the morning when there was no activity they went into the uh, into the cabin or the house where they were hole up and it turned out that they had uh, it appeared that they had killed themselves so in the end they buried them in unmarked graves and they said that almost immediately there began to be reports that they weren't killed and that they were still free and running around and that Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid were still alive and well and kicking and that it was not true that they had been killed. And I thought, how interesting is this that people talk about, oh, you, you, know, you couldn't ever get these myths that would grow out of something so fast, you know, that uh, when you have a, an issue like with Jesus and the resurrection, and they were like, oh, the idea that, you know, these myths would grow out of just, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, um, and that's not something that could happen, and I'm like, yeah, it, it can happen, <laughs> and, you know, it happened with uh, with these two, and, and somebody else was like, yeah, look at all the Elvis reports that we get, right, like people that have seen Elvis, but it, it was specifically interesting to me that almost, they said it was almost immediately that people began to question whether or not um, they had actually been killed and to actually claim that they were still alive. Hmm. Of course, people always do that when someone gets <laughs> killed, right? <laughs> I mean, Elvis. <laughs> well, that's what I say, yeah. you know, like, yeah, there, there are yeah. some Elvis reports and things like that. And, but... Uh, it, it's just, uh, it was an interesting thing that even though they had been hunted down and killed and there were tons of witnesses to the death, there were still people who said that they hadn't been killed. Mm. And that this so myth... was there evidence one way or the other? Well, they were buried in unmarked graves, so no. Mm. Okay. They couldn't prove it, but... But, but in that, you know, and in that case, I'm not sure that anybody would have cared. It was like it was publicly recorded, and that's all that mattered. Right. Yeah. People want life to be like a George R. R. Martin yeah. novel. If you don't definitely see the body, then and that was the other thing, I guess, it, is that the uh, the people the, the people that would have been involved in law enforcement as far as going and getting them and killing them weren't really even interested enough to even try and allay those stories, you know what I mean? There was no, they just, nobody went and said, well, let's go dig them up where we buried them and show the bodies, and which is kind of interesting to me because sometimes they did take pictures of outlaws that they killed. So mm -hmm. there were other people that they have photos of, you know, their dead bodies and things like that after they were shot dead. So I don't know. But just kind of fun the way that, you know, people don't always want to accept the reality of something like that when it occurs. Yeah, um, I don't know. You can't know for sure, I guess, but uh, this isn't... <laughs> uh, I don't know. To me, the, the the alive or dead status of a particular pair of outlaws like <laughs> doesn't seem important enough to warrant... Like, well, especially like with these Knowing the people. answer for sure. Yeah, like, these, this particular pair, um, I guess they, they had... Uh, quite the the reputation people were kind of supportive of them stateside like people liked them actually hmm. people thought andy kaufman was alive <laughs> like a few years ago was supposed to be the the anniversary of the or s like supposedly the day that he somehow predicted yeah. that he would show up again have you seen uh, the jim carrey biopic I have Man it. on the moon I have it, it. it's pretty funny he was a funny guy yeah. uh, he liked to prank people um, but there was some kind of conspiracy going around that was like 
bolstered by his best friend saying, oh, I don't think he, you know, I don't think my friend's really dead. I think he's been trolling this all the time. Well, he did do a lot of kind of surprise fake things when he was, you know, it was part of his humor. Trolling people was... The the wrestling thing was always a big, you know, like, Yeah, that that was the thing his comedy was all about. But uh, I think it's safe to say by now that that the moment of the optimal joke has already passed. (laughs) Yeah, and but it's just the other thing though. Like when you talk about Elvis, it's like it's really funny that you get sightings, you know, yeah. people that actually report sightings, and that's kind of funny too. Well, I, I mean, and I think I can tie this into a theme of the show, which is that people refer to something as skepticism, which is really just random refusal to believe a particular thing, uh, and actual skepticism is based on. You know, gen- general evidence of. I, I mean, how can I tie this in <laughs> properly? Help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> My whole thing is just how myths, you know, propagate, and people. Yeah. You, it's not hard to find people that'll say no, and I saw him. Right. And yeah, it's, it's like very no, you easy didn't. To get that to <laughs> He's dead. Okay, uh, we've wasted enough time. Uh, Brandon, how are you? Howdy. I'm doing great this evening. Uh, what's up? You can hear me? Yes. Breaking up a little, but go ahead. A little bit, yeah. I'm great this evening. Okay. I heard you. I'll share a little bit of my own atheist experience based around people are trying to describe super Uh, Let me stop you for a minute. I'm not sure if the issue is on our end or yours. Are you on a laptop or Wi-Fi or anything? I am. Oh. uh, Could you maybe get to a better spot? Uh, not really. It would be better if I just hang up. Uh, no, keep... Yeah, you probably won't be able to get back through if try you to get it. Try to get a quick question out and see uh, if we can just answer you off the air. Well, basically, I had two ideas that supernatural events only have two, two possibilities. Either everything is, like, follows laws anyway, so not really supernatural, or they... Can't be retested, so they're totally chaotic, and you can't study them anyways. So it's meaningless. Okay, and where do you fall on that? I I don't. It could be, and there could be some things that are chaotic, and other things that follow laws. I don't know which is which. Okay. But a countless, countless number of situations there could be. But those are basically, when someone comes to me trying to describe some situation, it's basically, can you tell me how? And if the answer is yes, cool, we can pursue it. But if, even if it is real and supernatural, but you can't tell me how, then that kind of ends everything right there. Yeah, it's and not really an explanation. It offers yeah, no explanatory like, power. Right. Even if it's real. Right. Like if someone could say Shazam and a banana appears on a table when they say Shazam, but there's no mechanism for it, right. then that's great. Your supernatural banana powers, but that yeah. doesn't help us understand anything about the universe. Right. We still can't well, explain why it occurs or how it occurs, I guess. Is right. The- like I've mentioned a few times in my uh, skepticism talk, uh, in, in the movie Ghost, uh, Whoopi Goldberg it turns out that she has the power to talk to ghosts, but she doesn't realize it, and so she's conning people by going around cold reading them, just like any psychic in the real world does. Um, and the interesting thing is, this is a universe where ghosts actually exist, but there are still con people, you know, con artists who are pretending to talk to uh, ghosts, and so you should still be skeptical, even if there's a possibility that it's true. Yeah, of each individual experience, because right. even in that case, it could turn out to be a Scooby-Doo case. Yeah, it's both old man Weatherby and the guy mask. Exactly. Well, I think okay. that's uh, about it. I'll let you get to someone else. Thank you. All right, thanks for calling. Uh, let's go to um, line three, and. Um, I'm sorry, I tried to text John, but I'm passing on line two today. Um, 
Uh, okay, so we got Keith in College Station. Hang on for just a minute. Uh, what else is going on in the world right now? Well, Westboro Baptist Church has decided to picket Kim Davis. What? Why would they do yeah. that? <laughs> because they believe that she's being hypocritical, that basically her own uh, marriage after the divorces is not biblical, <laughs> and that she's taking advantage of the fact that it's legal to do it even and to pursue it even though it's not biblical, and at the same time trying to deny people a legal right to pursue what she considers to be unbiblical marriages. Anytime the Westboro people come on, uh, show up in the news, I have the same question, which is, are they just trying to get a rise out of people, or do they really believe that? Like, I, I was, are they trying to outlaw divorce, or? No, no, it's not about, th what they're saying, yeah. they actually take a stand that you need to obey the laws, and right. that if it's legal, she should do it. And okay. so what they're saying is, if she wants to take advantage of those laws to have an unbiblical marriage and say that she doesn't have to follow the Bible as a Christian, she can go forward and pursue this type of a marriage that she has because it, even though it's unscriptural but it's legal, they're You're saying... You're telling me that the Westboro Baptist Church is for Kim Davis granting gay marriage? Yes. No way. Why? <laughs> okay. They're wow. actually now saying that because that's the law, and don't get me wrong, they'll be the first ones to start picketing the laws <laughs> about gay marriage, but yeah. at the same time, what they're saying is that as an officer of the court, you have to follow the law and grant these, and you're being a hypocrite to take advantage of the fact that it's legal but non-scriptural and do it yourself, and then t tell somebody else that they can't. Do you have a quote from them saying this? I've got this article. I'm sorry to be skeptical. No, no, it's fine. But Here we go. Yeah. Let me find the article. And this was at, I guess this, this was on um, Pathos is where we're looking at this. Uh-huh. Let me see. Though, and it was, yeah, this is um, from an article. I can't <laughs> blow it up, but oh, I, can, I yeah. can read the Enhance. tiny text. Enhance. I don't know how, <laughs> but, it, but I did read it, which was painful because it is little, but it's like a yeah, little okay. newspaper clipping. And right. it says... Um, Why don't we try to pull the, that up like while we're on with the next caller? Okay, and then, I've got uh, it. I okay. mean, I can, but it's just like, they say, uh, let's see, God Almighty it put a spotlight... This is the, I guess this is a news release from West Bureau. Uh -huh. God Almighty put a spotlight upon the proud, self-righteous hypocrites that think the same-sex marriage sin is worse than their adultery sin. <laughs> As it happened, the Supreme Court of the United States fulfilling their destiny made same-sex marriage the law of the land. The duty of all mankind is to obey the laws of God and the laws of man. Enter Kim Davis. Okay. Rowan. I, I mean, okay, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is, this is not this is definitely not the onion or anything like that. Well, they've got God hates adultery. Let's see. Yeah, this yeah. is they're saying it's the the release, I guess. Westboro huh. Baptist Chronicles or whatever. That is really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Keith, how are you doing? <laughs> Howdy. How are you guys doing? Hey. Howdy. Um, hey, I uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. I know you guys have talked about you know Planned Parenthood and, and abortion uh, several times in the last couple of ep episodes. Uh huh. But um, I'm an atheist, and um, I find myself oftentimes engaging with my Christian friends online. Okay. And this is a topic where I feel like I've I've struggled I've been struggling over the last few years with this issue, trying to be logical about justifying my beliefs overall. And uh, one thing I, I I recently was in a debate with a friend, and uh, you know in the past I've I've frequently argued that all federal funding should be cut from um, Christian aid or aid organizations because of the Establishment Clause. Okay, and, yes. Uh, talking to my friend, I kind of realized the hypocrisy of, you know, having previously advocated for this point, and then now currently there, you know, there's this argument that they want to cut, you know, funding for Planned Parenthood, which I, you know, I personally different. think is idiotic. I'll tell you why but, it's different. Well, okay. It is different, but go on. <laughs> well, well the, their, their justification being similar, I feel like it's similar to my argument in that they're saying that, <laughs> well, you know, they're advancing you know, uh, the, the, you know, their constant argument is that although the funding is not going directly to abortions, what the money that goes to these, these stations allows for their existence, and thus these, these, these places would not exist if not for federal funding, and thus even though the funding is not directly going to abortions, 
it's allowing there to be greater number of locations where abortions can be performed. Mm -hmm. But abortion is not a religious act, right? Yeah, but I mean, it's obviously it doesn't go against yeah, the here, Here's clause, the thing they're about being that it being illegal. If it, it, but a, a church, for example, could <laughs> operate a secular charity. Yeah. And then they could get funding, but that's not what they're doing, right? You have a place like, like you've got something like Habitat for Humanity that promotes a Christian message. This is promoting, it, it's they, on their website, they give the glory to God for everything that they do. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to integrate your religion with your charity, then you've made that step to make it the same. Yeah, but I mean, let me also draw a line, like, because I know a lot of people who are otherwise generally um, in favor of separation of church and state uh, talk like, well, you know, this federal for funding of abortion is a special case and we should exempt that. I want to ask you how you feel about, let's say, uh, public schools teaching evolution. Well, I'm obviously for it. Yeah, or I so, am for it. Yeah. So uh, I think a Christian would take a similar line of argumentation and say, hey, this is public money going into, th into something that offends me personally, uh, you know, that, that offends my religion. And because of the separation of church and state, uh, the state should not be promoting something that is against my religion. There's a problem with that argument, right? Yeah, but like, let's see that even, even without like, a justification where they would be arguing that you know, we've agreed that by legal matters that the federal government's not going to subsidize abortions, and that this is a back way of subsidizing it. Even though you know their reasoning might why, be well, yeah. My question why would be why? The federal yeah, government why wouldn't it be? What's the I, problem I totally with agree, it? but I, I feel like you know, the, I'm trying to like justify my argument for why, you know, if we if like we have to take into account the fact that it is illegal, although I don't think that it should be. Wait, what's illegal? For the federal government to subsidize abortions. It's not. Why should it be? They just don't. Okay. There's no law against... If they wanted to do it, they can do it. Right. So don't, I, it I mean, it's not that... that Planned Parenthood funding for abortion aren't, aren't Wait, what? subsidized. What? I can hear oh. you. Oh, sorry. But isn't it currently in place that plan, the funding for Planned Parenthood exists so that must do abortions? Wait, I don't understand what he's... Uh, there's a couple of issues to unpack there. He said, I think you said, and we've, we're having some line trouble again. But oh, sorry. I, I think you said uh, that Planned Parenthood exists just to get around laws against funding abortions. Is that what you were asking? Oh, I did case that currently funding does not go to abortion through Planned Parenthood. Right, it does not, correct. Correct, right. yeah. Right. Because there have been a, uh, there has been a lot of fighting on uh, on behalf of Republicans, basically saying that uh, we should pull all funding for that sort of thing. Although there are a couple of issues there. One is that the great majority of things that Planned Parent of services that Planned Parenthood provides, like um, uh, you know contraception and cancer screenings and uh, and general education of people. Um, uh, actual providing of abortions is a very small percentage of what they do as a whole. But having said that, there is, I don't believe there should be any legal problem with funding abortions in the same way that any, and to the same extent that any other normal legal medical procedure is funded. So for instance, um, the, there are disagreements about whether like the government should be in the business of providing insurance and I'm not going to, uh, you know, of, of helping people get health insurance and people derisively call it Obamacare. And that's not an issue that I'm going to get into because this isn't a political show. <clears throat> but what the federal government now provides is a means for people to buy into insurance. And uh, you could say that uh, anything they spend their insurance on, like cancer treatments or, uh, you know, blood pre pressure medication or anything like that, is being funded by the government, yeah. even though it's basically people paying into insurance and the insurance companies paying them back. But part of the controversy that's come up in the last few years is, 
I particularly don't like abortion, so right. I want to stop people on those programs from using their insurance money to pay for abortions. And I think it's nonsense that they're cutting out a special exemption for that. Yeah, nobody asks me whether or not, you know, when I send my tax money in, if there's certain things I don't support, nobody asks me if I would like to, you know, not have my money go to that. Right. But, but I think, you know, important, what's important to me is, if you had a church, let's say we have, you know, Jim's Church of Christ on the corner, and they decide there's like people within that church, and they're like, we want to operate a food bank. And so they start a food bank. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anybody's going to argue that public funding can't go to the food bank. I think the argument would be if you're going to call it Jim's Church of Christ Food Bank, <laughs> then there's a problem. I mean, we, we're not supposed to be funding anything we're not supposed to be doing anything that promotes an establishment of religion and if they want to do a charity and keep it secular but it just happens to be something like i mean just like with catholic hospitals right they have public hospitals i don't know what the the status is but i would be stunned if they don't get some kind of government subsidy for these private hospitals for certain things i mean i have to look it up but the issue for me is when you start integrating your religion into that effort, it's no longer like a, now you've made it not secular and now we can't support that with public funding. It's not that I would, would withhold public funding from a secular charitable effort just because a church instituted that. But mm -hmm. if they're going to do like a Catholic hospital and say, and we're going to deny people certain types of medical care because of our religious perspectives, well, that's not to me that, that at that point you've got a religious hospital. This exactly. is part of your church. And you're promoting your religion through this church by actually crafting what care is and isn't offered based on your religious views, not on medical views. And... I think the problem is that a lot of these, like for example, they want to do the, um, what do you call it, the, the vouchers, right, the school vouchers, mm -hmm. and they want those to go to private schools, and there are people saying they can go to religious schools, and I'm like, wait a minute, no, no, the moment you start to make that school religious, I have an issue with this, and you, you, you we, if we're, I don't know, that to me is a big problem, it's not that I don't ever argue that if I give money to your food bank on the corner, then you're going to be able to use funds that you raise through donations to do other things and that I'm somehow therefore inadvertently funding your church. I've never argued that. Like, that's just weird to me. I mean, are you, do, do people argue that? I feel like, I, I mean, I, I could see that argument existing where, wherein you say, you know, you are using this as a base of operations, and though your primary objective, you know, so that you say, is to provide needs for the public, mm -hmm. you're also using this location as a platform for advancing your religion. And if they are, abortion, then that's wrong. Abortion <laughs> yeah. is not a religious position. Right. Uh, but, but, but imagine, we, Matt, like, like if, if, if... Okay, sorry, the, sorry, Russell, the fact... Sorry. What? I, I was just going to say that... Um, what if a law was it to be established that said that no federal funding could go to support... Uh, abortions would then what, uh, the same the, logic exist that Planned Parenthood can no longer receive federal funding? Would would that would that occur? What would be the justification for that law, given that abortion has been stated by the Supreme Court to be legal? I'm just, I mean, it's not hypothetical. You know, I'm not well, saying that. Yeah, know, but it matters because there's a thing called the Lemon Test, uh, okay. which uh, which was uh, dealt with. I forget, maybe the '60s. Uh, where basically, um, uh, shoot, I would need to look this up, but basically the lemon test is something that the Supreme Court came up with to determine whether there is unnecessarily entanglement between uh, the law and religion. And they said when you propose a new law, um, there are like three tests that they mentioned, uh, which are like, you know, does the law have a clear secular purpose um, and... Uh, I'm, I'm looking, looking it up, up right now. Me out, yeah. I am. Um, yeah, so it's not just something you can gloss over because it's a legal mm -hmm. standard. So when I ask why would they pass a law by that, what I'm really asking is does that meet the lemon test? Yeah. Okay, great. I mean, I, I, I find this very helpful. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. 
Um, can I ask another one? I don't want to take up too much of your time on this topic. Uh, sure, go ahead. Tracy's still looking at it. I am. Um, if I come up with anything interesting, I'll <laughs> yeah. give a shot. Okay. Go ahead. The other, the other one I got into recently on this was, um, you know, I was kind of like, you know, I, I, I like um, uh, Jen, I think, oftentimes talks about the, the giving a kidney to a child analogy for uh, why... Uh, the, like, you know, the pro-life standpoint doesn't make logical sense that you should be forced to support a child for this period of time. And I was doing, it's basically like the cellist analogy, basically, that, you know, if you were hooked up to the, uh, you know, a famous cellist uh, and giving blood to this person, allowing them to survive, you uh, have no, no obligation to remain hooked up to them, keeping them alive. You know, you didn't choose to make that... Um, that choice, right? And so, uh, you know, my religious friend the other day came back. Well, that's that's an unfair analogy, and he came up with this alternative one where he said, Wait, I'm, "Why?" I get, well, he's going to tell you what okay. The, okay. his friend came up with. Um, so it's uh, I want to get this right. So it's basically uh, imagine that there's some, you know, it's very hypothetical. There's some new technology that exists whereby um, a person who's HIV positive. Um, has a drug within them that becomes adapted to their the the genome within the HIV virus that they contain, and uh, so the longer that your drug, the more your drug becomes adapted to fighting HIV within you. Now, let's say that person who's HIV infected has sex with an HIV and infects them. I'm, it's already a I'm missing some of that. You're breaking up. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to speak slower. Maybe that'll help. Okay. But, um, so this person who's HIV positive, who's already undergoing treatment for their HIV, has sex with another individual without informing them that they're, they're going to be endangered for, for contracting HIV. And that person, that second person, contracts HIV and becomes sick. Now, the only thing that would save that person who's now become immunocompressed due to being contracting HIV is a direct blood transfusion from the person who unknowingly infected them with HIV, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so under that, I mean, I could see his, I could see to a degree his point here, where like, well, wait a minute, person, wait a minute, wait a minute. So okay. let's say that the blood transfusion was the only thing that would save them. Are you saying that you think the law would force the transfusion? Because I don't. Uh, this this I'm, is I'm, also. No, I don't know about the law. I'm not talking. This about is a weird question. analogy. Well, but this is a legal question. This is a weird analogy. It is. Because, it's a messed up uh, analogy because it's taking something that is specifically an immoral act, which is basically having sex with someone while knowingly tra being in a position to transmit HIV to them, uh, with without giving them uh, information that they can use to properly consent to this yeah, action. Yeah, you're basically and deceiving them. And it's comparing it to just a woman having sex. Right. When I, she has, I got this right. <laughs> when she has sex, this other person, there's no other person that exists except for the person she's having sex with, and there is no reason to think that it's going to result in a pregnancy. I mean, I guess that's the thing that gets me is like, why? What, why would we assume that it's that a pregnancy is going to result in a? I mean, that a sex act would result in a pregnancy when people, in general, are very not very good procreators as far as. Um, Animals yeah, and, go. I mean, this really well, fits in with like my perspective on a lot of on a lot of anti-choice people because basically they think that the act of having sex without intending to have a baby is in itself immoral. Well, here's another question, though. Right? <laughs> it sounds like what they're saying is that the sex act comes with an inherent risk of pregnancy, and that I mean, it's it's to me it's like the it's the old thing. You had sex. Right? I mean, that's what, that's what it's boiling down to. The woman had sex, therefore, whatever, is, whatever happens as a result of that, she has no right to, to mitigate any risks, or if a risk event occurs, she can't do anything to stop it. She just needs to put her health and life at risk and go proceed with this gestation, right? I mean, that's what they're arguing. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, when you, let's say, that in, let's say that this woman had sex and she wants to have a child. <clears throat> right? Okay, so she, she has sex intending to get pregnant, wants to have a baby. And so she has, gives birth to this baby, and she knows beforehand that she carries, let's just say that she knows beforehand she carries like a, a risk of some genetic issue. Right? And the baby may like need HIV. tissue. Well, right? the, the child might need tissue, it might need, you know, uh, blood or whatever. And so she gives birth to this child. And sure enough, like within the first week, the, the liver starts to fail. 
and she is like a almost a natural donor because she is a match and she says I don't want to have surgery to remove part of my liver and to um, donate that mm -hmm. is that legal uh, I don't think it is yes I, it I mean, is <laughs> yes it is oh. legal wait I, I mean I'm, I'm trying to agree with you I don't maybe I didn't say it correctly but okay yeah. I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out. It's like she knew that there was this risk. The risk event occurred. She decides not to donate the kidney or the, the piece of liver. And the infant is going to die as a result. And as a nation, we accept that as reality and not her obligation. Even if she was 100% on board and, and intended to become pregnant before she ever had sex. She still is not beholden to have even a, a, a surgery to remove a piece of liver to save her own infant's life. What, how, how would that differ from the HIV analogy? Then? What do you mean, what? how would it differ? Look, in so the you're HIV... Wait, wait. Well, you're, you're logically putting them at risk. Yeah. Without I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, how, I'm asking you, how would that be different than the HIV analogy? In, in the HIV analogy, if I may, there yeah. are two different things that are being discussed. One of them is... Uh, is it legal or ethical to ha have sex with someone knowing that you have that you are at significant risk of pass passing HIV on to them and not tell them? And the other thing is, given that the first thing already happened, are you morally obligated or legally obligated? Legally is what we're asking. <clears throat> to make restitution about that by. Uh, doing whatever weird biological thing this bio this person came up with when he was crafting the analogy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you have um, to look at what if doing so would put the person with HIV at risk of death. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... you know, yeah. But still, right. when I was talking about her knowing, like planning the pregnancy, getting pregnant, having the baby, knowing there's this genetic risk that develops, and then she says, I'm not donating the kidney. I mean, I'm not donating the, the liver part. Do you see that as significantly different than the HIV analogy? I feel like, I mean, I feel like that is, I mean, that is different, but... How? I, 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 well, no, I mean, I, I, I feel like, in, I've, I try to make these similar arguments. I've talked to him, and I he call, he called me out on making basically special pleading, sort of like coming up with these 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 particular instances in which the case does not exist. And he maybe it was my mistake because we were talking about it from a moral standpoint as opposed to a legal um, standpoint about whether or not the, the each individual in each case is morally obligated. Yeah, and morality and law are two different things, and all that really matters in the abortion debate is the law. This yeah. is what's being discussed. Well, the morality yeah. of it matters also, so to speak. I mean, it's worthy of discussing. Um, yeah. If you want to discuss it, but it's not going to... I mean, what, laws are not based on morality, and morality is not based on the law. <laughs> so, I mean, we... But, I, I mean, I am serious here that, that if your friend was trying to discuss this with me, I would not focus on the aftermath. I would focus on why are you comparing a woman who, who is just having sex without intending to have a baby to a person who is knowingly making somebody else contract HIV? Because one of them is super immoral. Do you think that the other one is comparable to that or not? Yeah, that a woman that has sex is in that position that she is automatically just, you know, evil. But I still am wondering, when I do the analogy with the, the infant that needs the liver part in a week, do you, does that in your head align to that HIV analogy? Yeah, and I, I don't think that there would be a legal obligation, but... I well, I know there's her. not. I mean, I don't yeah, not think it. I know it's not a legal obligation for her to do that. And so but if I, that's... I, 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 I acknowledge that, the, but the, I, I acknowledge that. Although I don't think, I personally don't believe that she should have to give the the the, the liver, the, child, the liver. But I, yeah. I do think that there is a, it's questionable morality in the decision. Like it's not like I think that she has to or she should be forced to. But the discussion we were saying what we're having is about whether or not that sort of situation would still be moral. Yeah, this is a, this is simply a physical reality that this is how the child was born. Yeah, she knows she carries this risk, and the risk event occurred, and so she has a baby that's not going to survive, and she's saying, okay, and the baby is going to die a natural death. She didn't murder it, right? Mm -hmm. 
The baby is dying as a result of in inadequacies of its own physiology, not because the mother was immoral. And we're not obligated to, I guess, d give up our own bodies or, or something to Perfect. that extreme in order to save someone from a natural death. Yeah. It's a tough one. I mean, I, I don't want to keep taking up your time on this, but um, I mean, I think that what, how I, 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 that's basically what I was, I was arguing but then he came back that it's like, well, even, even if the person that was HIV positive was taking all of these precautions, you know, they were still putting another human life at risk. It and just I, like the person, uh, the woman was putting another human life at risk with her decision. No, she wasn't. She was having sex. Sex has nothing. This, this other person doesn't even exist, right? At the, at the point she made a decision to have sex with someone, the person that, that they're invoking in their analogy does not even exist. I, I, I guess I'll have to There think isn't about even it. a person there to deceive or to lie to or to do anything wicked to. There is no person. She's simply having a decision to have sex. The pregnancy is an unintended consequence. In fact, and, and that's the other thing that I think makes me angry is that people tend to distort this as though they, they act like every sex act ends in pregnancies or ends in some kind of conception. And it's like, no, relatively few of them do. Or should. Yeah, some yeah. of them seem to think. And the, uh, in, in the human species, sex is mostly a social act. Okay, mm -hmm. so we, there are some species that are very good at procreating. They have sex, like the, the females come into heat, for example, so that they, they only are receptive to sex acts when they're in a situation where they can conceive. Human beings are not like that, right? We don't have that um, restriction. There are some species that only mate during those periods. We can mate any time. We don't know, really, except for modern science, we really didn't understand when women would like, come into estrus, I guess is what it's called, right? And so it would just be like, you could have sex any time. And up until very recently in human history, did we even understand when the period was that she was most susceptible to conceive? And also, uh, the male, I mean, the the male penis functions in order to pump out competitive sperm. Like, what would be the the advantage of that? And then, that uh, that same mechanism, um, he'll go flaccid after he ejaculates, which means that he's then um, not not you know not pumping his his own fluids out. So if he were to have sex with her after another man did, his penis will act to pull that fluid out. Right. Then he ejaculates in its state. So he's built for male competition or in sex. Mm -hmm. She's built to have sex any time, whether she's fertile or not. I mean, if, you, if people can't look at this and tell that the, the predominant function of sex in human populations is social, not re re reproductive. If, if I may, uh, I think what you're saying is valid on a lot of levels, but I also think that getting into what things are intended for or, uh, or trying to appeal to the way that, that they work in a mechanical sense uh, is a, a little bit at risk of uh, uh, descending into the naturalistic fallacy. I'm not, but what I'm talking well, about is they're already going there, but they're even wrong. Right. So yeah, they're, they're going are, there and saying they are that. wrong, but I mean, I think m the point would be that there are, uh, that basically people want to have sex without, right. ha uh, without uh, incurring the risk of pregnancy. Sure. That is mostly possible and completely possible when, when you add in abortion, given the abundance of contraceptive, contraception and modern technology that we have available. Uh, and unless it can be demonstrated that this is an immoral action to have to do things, people should get to do what they want, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess what I'm pointing out though is they they seem to oh they seem to t closely associate conception with sex in a way that they it's almost like if I were to say that um, having a, a fatal car accident is a risk that you know that you're aware of when you get into a car right which it is right but they treat it like man if you get into a car you know you're gonna die in a car accident. And it's like, no, that's, that's not at all true. You can go your whole life trying to have a baby and never conceive. I mean, and a lot of times couples aren't really, don't have, a, don't have any sort of physical uh, 
problem with conception, but they still go years and can't conceive. I mean, we're not the best procreators on, in, on the planet as far as a species. We're very bad. But at the same time, I, I'm not, all I'm trying to say is their, their weird association with almost like it's almost a, a you've got to know you're going to get pregnant if you're having right. sex and it's like that is a weird leap yeah okay anyway well thank you guys so much i really i love you i love both you guys and i love the show so thank you for taking my time talking i love you too Keith. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first <laughs> Uh, see ya. Uh, next, we are going to take uh, I, yeah line one, Dale in London, and in the meantime, I've got the lemon test up. So unless oh, you're going to read it, no, uh, I brought it up. I didn't read it. So if you've read it, then go for it. All right. The lemon test uh, was uh, the result of a case in 1971 called Lemon v. Kurtzman, uh, and the court ruled unanimously in an eight to zero decision and it was uh i believe it had something to do with creationism in schools uh don't have time to read more carefully than that but basically uh the lemon test which is the second section in the wikipedia article on lemon v kurtzman says uh this uh the detail the requirements for re legislation concerning religion uh, the statute must, okay, so number one, the statute must not result in an, an, an excessive government entanglement with religious affairs, where the factors of that are character and purpose of the institution benefited, nature of aid the state provides, and resulting relationship between government and religious authority. Number two, the statute must not advance nor inhibit religious practice. So although uh, religious people might argue, oh, the fact that other people are allowed to have abortions is inhibiting my religion, it is not. Uh, number three, the statute must have a secular legislative pur purpose. And the reason we brought that up was because uh, at the beginning of the call, uh, you correctly stated that uh, religions should not get direct funding from governments unless they have, uh, unless there is some kind of secular purpose to the okay. fun uh, to the uh, funding, which is exactly what the Lemon Law says, mm -hmm. uh, and that is not the same as religious people going out of their way uh, to try to outlaw something which is already legal according to the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that offends your religion, yeah. but we can't make the laws that are just based on your religion yeah. in either direction. Yeah, and I think like when we were talking about the schools, you know, a Catholic private school named like St. Mary's private uh -huh. school, um, that would to me would be a religious character. And then when right. you have courses that are about catechism, you know, I mean, you're promoting your religion. Yes. So. Yeah, I definitely would be like, no, there's no public funding going to that. Right. Dale, are you there? Dale? Dale in London. Hello? Hmm. Do we have no Dale? <sighs> I'm not hearing uh, Dale. Oh, wait, he just no, no, disappeared he's, from he's the He's there. He's on what? the screen. He's just not on the line. No, well, he's on the... They yeah. still, they didn't, they didn't still remove exists. him from the list. They All just... Right. Uh, Give Let me know. somebody. <laughs> if it's not Dale, then it's going to be Brian in Colorado. One or the other. Uh, let me know in a minute. Uh, what else you got, Tracy? All right. Oh, shoot. And I just closed my... I hit the wrong button, but let me pull this up and see if I can find something fun. Um, what else was there? We were talking earlier about Westboro. But, oh, there was the, uh, the weird cult that beat the two teenage oh, yeah, boys I to death. That here. Yeah, that was... That was not, I don't even know quite what that is. I mean, originally it was reported as like a Christian, Christian counseling incident, but then the more I heard about it, the more weird it got. So Okay, this was reported on October 16th from uh, New Hartford, New York. It's coming from bigstory.ap.org. Uh, I don't know what big story is, but AP is a, is the actual news organization. Yeah. So I'm going to assume that this it is... It was on regular news, too. I mean, the story... A reliable, neutral yeah, story. this happened. Uh, a mother and father whipped their 19-year-old son in church with an electrical cord and what appeared to be a belt during a deadly all-night spiritual counseling session triggered by his desire to leave the fold, according to witness testimony and police Friday. 
Church deacon Daniel Irwin testified he peered through a doorway window in the sanctuary during the more than 12-hour ordeal at the Word of Life Christian Church and saw Lucas Leonard bleeding in an apparent agony. Lucas was rolling himself back and forth on the floor and making a sustained monotoned, monotone moaning, Irwin said. Within hours, the young man would be dead, killed by blows inflicted by his parents, sister, and fellow church members, authorities said. Yeah. Damn it, religion. Yeah. Now, to be fair, this was like a, some kind of strange little cult. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what their deal was. It wasn't a mainstream, you know, church, but... Still, what, right. what people will do to their children. Yeah, and um, to tie this back into the previous topic, things that would be illegal under all other circumstances in any secular situation yeah. don't suddenly become legal right. just because it's a religious person saying, oh, my religion requires this. Yeah, it is really interesting. There is this attitude in some, sometimes I see this where they'll have a, there'll be a situation where somebody wants exemption for a particular law mm -hmm. and it's just like you know there's a difference between the law not persecuting you because of your religion and the law not applying to you because of your religion those are two different things you know it's it, the the laws shouldn't be made in such a way as to persecute somebody for a religious purpose and i believe me i understand that um you know sometimes they're flagrant but sometimes just like with racist laws or you know uh, sexist laws or anything like that you can have a situation where somebody is subversively trying to build a law that you know, and this, I think, is part of what you were talking about. The idea is, is this law, um, sometimes you'll put something in place that targets a particular group, mm -hmm. and yeah, you apply and, it to the whole and population. And the law that is specifically against one religion, and this is the important thing with the Lemon Test, does not have a secular purpose. Right. It's not secular right. to grind down another religion, right. whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam or whatever. Right, and target them in some way through the law, even if you pretend that, well, this law applies to everyone. Well, yeah, but who else is doing this except for this little religious group that you right. want to hammer? Outlaw things that are actually directly harmful. To society, and yeah. make sure everybody is, is uh, subject to that law. Okay, have we got Dale in London? Yes, I'm here. All right, hey. hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, thanks. Um, I just got a couple of questions, actually. Um, I'm, um, I was a Christian for years and years, like, come from a very religious background. My, my mum has three sisters. They're married to ministers, like, proper into it. I used to work in a church. And uh, probably about a year ago, I think I read, um, well, I didn't think I read, I did read the Dawkins book, The God Delusion, and mm -hmm. thought, there's, there's not too much in there I don't disagree with at all. Um, and from there it became, like, you know, what you class as an atheist. This was about a month before my Christian wife and I got married. And she was just like, are you really serious? Like, you know, is this, are you, you don't believe anymore? And I was like, I don't think I do. We got married anyway. And, but one of the things that, you know, things are good, but one of the things that is kind of um, difficult for us is that we used to pray together and now we don't because obviously I can't so sure. it's um I was just wondering do you have anything or do you know of something that you would do that would replace that I, I understand like the psychological reasoning for why praying with somebody is is building and is good for you um from a relationship point of view do you know of anything sort of uh, that doesn't doesn't go from that sort of down that route? If well, you, if my you wife I mean. and I play video games together sometimes, but I don't think that's what you're looking for. You know, um, this one this reminds me of uh, I think it was Stephen Covey that wrote a story about him and his wife, and he was saying something about how they set aside this certain time once a week where they sat and told each other things that they thought, and. The purpose of the exercise was that whatever the other person told you, you could not like criticize it, you couldn't you know, question, you just had to be supportive of like whatever they were telling you in that hour. That, that's a common thing that counselors will tell you to do, is just you know, sit down together and talk about what's important to you yeah. and don't argue about it, just listen. 
Yeah, and I mean that could potentially be a really difficult thing, especially yeah. in a situation where you know you've come to lose that belief and she still has it. But it might be a safe space for you guys to to air your differences in a way that you just don't even argue about it. She can express herself. You can express, and it doesn't even have to be religious. It could be other things too, like you or her might have something that you think the other one might not react well to. You know, and it's like you just talk mm. about it, and it's like the other partner just is supportive. Um, oh, that's, that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think that in addition to that, because I think actually you should do that in your marriage no matter what. I think not enough people do that kind of thing. Um, but additionally, uh, it is good to have some common interests. And I think what you've lost is you had that common interest of praying together. And now that's just something that you don't both like anymore. How and often? That's, how often did they? That's like, how often did you guys do that? Um, it wasn't really a thing. It wasn't like we spent every Monday night and sort of um, thrashed it out, not or any. But it was kind of like if we had an issue, or we just sometimes we went to bed together, and it was just like you know we want to sleep, maybe thinking about praying, you know. And, yeah. And okay. One of those, it was an ad hoc thing that we used to be able to go back to, and always found it quite encouraging and building. Right. Um, I understand. But it's just like. You know, I've, I've been married twice, and in both cases there have been things that we started out both liking, and then we lost that common interest for one reason or another. But, you know, that's okay, because despite uh, the kind of traditional romantic notion that you basically become one person when you get married, <laughs> you don't, yeah. Uh, yeah. and you don't have to do everything together. Uh, but you should try, like, I think if you don't have any common interests right now that you share, you should actively seek some out, whether it's a particular Netflix show that you both become fans of, or it's a physical activity like, I don't know, bowling, <laughs> or yeah. or you're in England, so cricket. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, you know, I, I jokingly tossed out the fact that uh, my wife and I play video games together. Uh, that's not for everyone, but it is an activity that we both enjoy, and the fact that we're doing it together kind of uh, gives us t some togetherness time uh, that is just, you know, we're setting aside this particular time to be together. Um, yeah. And now I feel yeah, like I'm absolutely. talking to you less about atheism, but about relationship counseling. So I think <laughs> that it would be fair to say that uh, you should also think about getting a real qualified counselor instead of me. Well, except that yeah. he doesn't sound like he's saying that, you know, the marriage is doing horribly. It sounds like he's just saying, well, there's these weird little things that have shifted. I mean, is that about correct or is there bigger issues? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah. like, I've only been doing, I've only sort of, sort of, so but I'll tell you, a, really a, I know, a counseling session can be a fun thing. Like, yeah, if that's yeah. something that you guys want to do, I, I encourage that. that. Yeah, I'm not saying that the counseling should be a last resort as an emergency <laughs> right. to fix things that are about to break. I'm saying yeah. that it's good to get counseling in a, in a preemptive sort of way if it's available to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was more of a case of, sort of like, like, like you touched on, it. it's nothing sort of really hugely bad. It's just that I know that she misses that and sort mm -hmm. of I, I, I don't want her to sort of feel like she's missing out just because we don't believe the same thing now. And, uh, and I suppose just because I knew that, like having listened to your show, I knew that um, uh, at least you, Tracy, I think you used to be Christian. So I, th I figured, yeah, yeah. Like, well, if you knew, um, like, you know, like the sort of what would replace the, the praying thing in that sort of way and what you said was you know really helpful and i think that's uh, that is definitely something i will suggest to her so that's um that's really helpful thanks oh, a lot good. For that. Do, you, do, you, do you have time for one more yeah question? you said you had something else sure yeah yeah i've um <clears throat> i don't know if you guys have seen please don't like hang up on me when i say this but <laughs> if i don't know if you guys have seen the the, the movie zeitgeist the movie. <laughs> click but no just okay, kidding yeah fair enough I yeah. appreciate the guy that did it might be a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. I don't, I don't know why the feeling I get from it. But um, the, the first part of it, it talks about all the religions that predate Christianity that had the same thing, like, you know, born of a virgin, died on the cross, had 12 disciples, and all these different things. I literally saw that probably about three months, four months after I became an atheist. And I sat and I thought, how am I only hearing this now? Because it seemed to be quite a big deal. And I looked it up. And it does seem to check out, but nobody really no. that I sort of... <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, sorry, sir? 
I, I'm sorry, but uh, there are arguments to be made that are somewhat credible from the point of view uh, uh, that maybe there, w uh, maybe Jesus never existed and was based on a conglomeration of fictional characters. Uh, but Zeitgeist does not have that uh, academic credibility in any way. It brings in a whole bunch of yeah. spurious stuff that uh, that you can find if you look up stuff like Zeitgeist debunked and just don't just assume that they're uh, from a pro-Christian point of view. Um, mm. Basically, I actually recently had a brief exchange with Richard Carrier, who I met a couple of years ago, um, because somebody on Twitter was saying to me, uh, this guy is telling me that pretty much every credible historian agrees that Jesus really existed, that there is a strong consensus that there was a real character behind Jesus. What should I say against him? And I was like, don't say anything against him because he is actually right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, uh, the I will be the first to say that the evidence marshaled in, fl in favor of a historical Jesus is not the greatest historical evidence I ever saw. But historians do tend to have a general consensus on that, and I'm talking secular historians. And I asked Richard Carrier to back me up on this, and he said, oh yeah, I'm super duper in the minority, and I have not managed to, uh, you know, make enough of a case that it's turning around mainstream history yet and i think i will eventually but you're right <laughs> don't right. try to argue that historians don't believe in a <laughs> historical jesus okay yeah, yeah i never sort of thought that like because i mean i i kind of knew that he existed for real but i i didn't know well, i believe that he existed for real but it was just when i saw that thing on zeitgeist and i thought is that is that really true like did loads of other mm -hmm. religions predate Jesus and still have this born of a virgin died on a cross is is that then not so much the case it's it's, it's kind of just clumped it all together and has made it up sort of thing is that right uh it's it's mixed yeah I and take it with a grain of salt up. and if you don't have a if you can't vet one of those claims with a good mm -hmm. you know edu source don't use it we actually have gotten mail i remember one guy in particular who wrote to us and was extremely upset because he had laid down these arguments to his father who's religious and his dad said i want to see your sources and when they went looking they really couldn't find it any credible sources to support a lot of what he had claimed and he was very upset and he came to us saying you know where's the support hey, how for this can I dig myself yeah. out of this hole I've got and I said here. hey we didn't make the film <laughs> right yeah, yeah so yeah. I well, didn't I would... make the claim and I can't tell you how to support claims that you put forward from another person that you didn't vet yourself right yeah, yeah, because I, 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 I'd watched it and I was quite amazed by it, but then I thought, right, well, this wasn't in The God Delusion, which seemed to cover everything that did and didn't seem relevant, and that surely should have been in there if it was one of those things that was... Because that, like, that would be a pretty big deal, right, if you yeah, had yeah. <laughs> like, this sort of historical evidence. And it wasn't in that. I never really ever hear you guys talk about it. I occasionally sort of listen to um, um, non-profits as well and a few other things, and I was like, nobody ever talked about it, and I thought, this is right. weird that yeah. nobody else yeah. is seeming to jump on this bandwagon. <laughs> I think... So I thought, I yeah, I, I mean, the, the scholarship it on it is kind of shaky and up in the air, uh, but Zeitgeist is especially not credible. Yeah. It's full yeah. of a ton of, I mean, it's got so much nonsense that it's not even worth your time to try to sort out well, which is real and, and which is the nonsense. Other, the other thing to always remember is that if something predates something else, if you have two similar ideas and one predates the other, that doesn't necessarily indicate that one influenced the other. So this is really important because there's a lot of um, resurrection myths and okay. some suggestion that those myths come of, out of agricultural societies, right? So they have this concept of death and rebirth because of how they live. Whereas, you know, certainly there are some myths, and I wouldn't doubt resurrection myths, especially when you're looking at like Greek and Roman mythologies that do influence each other but you've got to be able to demonstrate the connection there it's not just enough to say you know hey this reminds me of this other thing therefore um, it has to be reliant upon this other thing it could just be yeah. that there is in fact some sort of universal between two cultures that give rise to something very similar yeah um, if you do want to read 
uh, a somewhat credible source about the uh, you know possible non-historicity of Jesus. I mentioned Richard Carrier, and we're not at the public access studio, so I'm totally going to say buy this book. Uh, his <laughs> latest book is from 2014, and it's called His On the Historicity of Jesus: Why We Might Have Reason for Doubt. Yeah. And notice how tentative the title is, yeah. even for a guy who's basically promoting yeah. that. And it was written for yeah. peer review, so yeah. and this was a book that was intended for you know peer consumption right so I would say yeah. this is the most useful thing you can read if you want to make your case probably okay brilliant that's cool that's cool thanks ever so much for that guys I'll let you get on with somebody else and uh, thanks for taking my call it's been really helpful thank you okay thanks for calling thanks uh, bye bye uh, we're now past the hour and a half mark. We whizzed by it about four minutes ago, and I don't care. But uh, if anyone on the studio in the studio is tired and wants to get to dinner, I say speak now or forever hold your peace. We're going to stop taking more calls, uh, but we've got two more on the line, and we are going to uh, relax and take those calls, right? Sounds good. Okay. Uh, Brian in Colorado, uh, you are on next. And, uh... Oh, are we what? supposed to look at stuff? Let's see. Yeah. Do I have anything here? What's relevant? Hmm. Someday, I oh, swear, Catholic we're going to have a box that we can just hit. Catholic Hospital denies Michigan women treatment on religious grounds, right? Oh, no. So she has an issue where it's dangerous for her to get pregnant again, and she wanted to. Ha it was recommended to her, medically recommended, that she be sterilized so that she not have another pregnancy because it's dangerous, like medically dangerous for her. She has other children, and the Catholic Hospital said, no, we don't do that. Hmm. So they're willing to, on religious grounds, deny her medical care that keeps her from being at mortal risk while she already has children at home who need her. Oh. Yeah. And that, that's a nice Christian value. That's pretty crappy. Let three children grow up without a mother because we don't want to sterilize this woman who should not get pregnant again, according to doctors. That's terrible. Yeah, nice uh, Catholic hospitals. I misspoke a minute ago. I meant we had gone past the hour mark. But okay. We can go up to an hour <laughs> I was like, wow, we've been here a long time. No, yeah. But okay. I, we can definitely talk to Brian, and I certainly hear him making a lot of noise. Here we go. Are you there? I finally got here, guys. Hey. hey. Man, barely made it. Technology. I had you, had you going through two different wireless devices. Oh, like good grief. The stream. Well, you are not breaking up like some of the other callers we've talked to today, so that's a good sign. You, whatever you yeah. did, keep doing it. <laughs> Yeah, I've got I've got wireless headphones on on the uh, on the iPhone and okay. the iPad streaming the visual, so no problem. I just want to say, as a software geek, isn't the 21st century awesome? <laughs> oh man, I've I've worked for two thumbs up for the 21st all century. All those guys, and I'm not in it now, but I'm glad I can still survive. It's mm -hmm. freaking yeah. awesome. Global warming, but well connected. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> global warming. Yeah, not not so good for the circuits, but. Uh, up here on the mountain, it's, it's nice and cool anyway. Okay. But anyway, guys, I appreciate you taking my call. First time caller, love your show. First time ever called in now. Actually, I'm going to say it. Brian is like, uh, from an audio standpoint, the best sounding caller we've had today. That's so pretty far. good. Well, yeah, hey, you know, we, we stream it on different things and separate it. Yep. Are that, am I hearing birds? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on my deck at 9,700 feet in a, on top of a Colorado mountain. You lucky bastard. <laughs> That's Mr. Lucky Best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, hey, guys, I appreciate both of you. Um, and uh, I'm a relatively new atheist. I was a, um, a youth minister about three years ago. Oh, and, that's a shift. <laughs> yeah, my frontal lobe kicked in. <laughs> so, basically, I, what I was interested in calling about is I've, I've watched you guys a lot, and I've, you know, read, read all the hitch and stuff, and, you know, all the icon guys and what their arguments are. Um, but recently I was down at um, a college here in Colorado, in Denver, and there's a street preacher, preacher there, and I saw this old woman standing there um, just listening to him. He was talking about morality. <laughs> and, um, you know, he said, well, you know, you, you can't have a moral compass if you don't, if you're, you know, if you don't believe God, there's no moral compass, there's no morality. And this old woman looked and said, why should I care? about morality and Ooh, no. Ooh. the guy now she it, it ended up good okay. uh, and so um the guy looked at me he was just aghast he said well you know 
there would be no trust. Um, the social fa- our social fabric would fall apart. Ah, I see where you're <laughs> going all- now. Yeah, and uh, you would always be looking over your shoulder, and, and you wouldn't be able to trust anybody. And this old, this old lady looked at me and said, "That's a great list. That really is." And those were all the reasons why I'm moral. And you never mentioned God one time. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, well, that's- I actually like that. Yeah, I was I was, was worried good. where that was going, but no, 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 it was really good because you know I've I've had the same problem you know where you where you're talking a point uh, and you go well morality you're starting off with you have to have God and here I am I'm an atheist I have a handicapped child that I've adopted um, his brother as well and I'm an atheist so I'm not getting mine from God and I'm certainly a moral guy. But, I, but that, that's the first time oh, that, that I've seen somebody just stop and go, wow, you got me. <laughs> it's an <laughs> interesting you approach. You well, know, I, liked it. I liked it a lot. And, and you know, I, I argue a lot with friends. And, and, my, and I'm originally from Dallas. And my friends are very, very, and my family, you know, as you would expect in, in mm-hmm. Texas, very, very religious. Everywhere um, in but, Texas but Austin, anyway. Oh, yeah, Austin. Oh, God. <laughs> I love Austin. Unfortunately, my work is here. So, yeah. But um, it, it was like I say, it was one of the first times that I ever that I ever saw somebody get a point in because I, I realized not too long ago that I wasn't really arguing with people. Nobody was going to change because of the argument that I was making. It, it took me a while to realize that you know this is maybe for other people that might hear this, might be standing on the sidelines. But the hardcore person that you're talking to, you're never going to change their mind, or I, I've at least not seen anyone do that. Sure, right. I understand what you're saying. Right. Yeah, so, but um, anyway, guys, uh, love your show. Um, <laughs> uh, pot, you know, listen to it all the time, and keep up the good work, and <laughs> look forward to hearing from you guys again. All right. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you for calling. That was very interesting, actually. Thanks. Well, yeah, I, appreciate I, it. I thought I liked it. Yeah, I like it too. Especially since it was a much older lady than I. I You can apply it to a lot of things, actually. Like anytime somebody wants to say that God is responsible for a thing, and you say, "Well, why? You know, why should I even care? Why would that matter?" I think, like, I have had the. So what if it wasn't? I've had the (laughs) thought before that when people are going to say, "Well, you have to believe in God because there's no morality," they are already assuming that you have a moral framework because they are expecting you to be horrified by that and so exactly um, Exactly. yeah and so this was like one one step more than the socratic method of questioning it was like i don't care now come after me and prove me why i'm wrong Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah because if all they can come back with is it displeases god (laughs) right that's really not much of a that's not very compelling no, the look on the guy's face was, you know, he was just kind of like, okay, I got this one got past me. That's nice. <laughs> and, you know, you, you never really see that because normally, it, even if it has got past them, they recognize it and just deny that it got past them. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that one before. That's pretty good. Yeah, I liked it. I liked All it. Right. So I, I thought you guys would too. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Have a great one, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Uh, and the last person we've got today is Rowan in Arizona. Uh, and while we're waiting on Rowan to come on the line, I just want to say um, I just got back from a business trip in California where uh, earlier this year I also went to a convention. Uh, and I'm excited because I haven't normally been the kind of person who gets to take business trips, so this was a blast. Uh, but I also took a little time out um, to hang out with the Backyard Skeptics, which is uh, Bruce Gleason's group. Uh, and Hello. They, yeah, not yet. <laughs> Give me a minute, Ron. Um, anyway, there were... Uh, they were super hospitable, and, and it's a great group. They're in Orange County. And more generally, I want to extend a great thanks to everybody who showed me hospitality while I was there in California. Uh, had a really wonderful time the whole week and some of the weekend. Uh, and now I can't hear anything on my speaker. Oh, I hear you but, now. Okay, Rowan? Oh, hi, yes, this is Rowan. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to be on the show. Thanks for letting me talk to you. Uh, I wanted to uh, just kind of point out a, uh, the way that religions uh, typically use artwork and artistry in general, like music, and 
mm -hmm. general, you know, theatrics and how they use that to kind of, I guess, manipulate people. And yes. I just wanted to see that y'all recognize that, like you know how that works and all, right? I don't know specifically what you're going to say, but I mean, yeah. Okay, would sure, you yeah. I'm, I'm being that? vague in general here. Um, but, uh, specifically, though, uh, I kind of wanted to highlight the differences between the scientific method, uh, you know, using objective <coughs> data and all that sort of thing, falsifiable claims and all that, and comparing that to the method of learning uh, about the world like uh, art, uh, art as being totally different. And how, Are you going uh, I to? Think that I mean, I hope you're not going to say that that art is a waste of time and uh, and shouldn't be pursued in general because it's dishonest in some way. Because I'm sure not going to agree with you on that. Oh, I, I appreciate that uh, because I'm standing right here in front of my uh, tablet as I'm drawing, and yes. uh, you know, I, I myself am an artist, and so I'm thinking, like, what I'm wondering what you guys think uh, is the position, uh, the best use of art. Uh, as a means of learning, um, what what is good about it, uh, as opposed to like as being a different learning method than the scientific method, right? I See, have a great example. I'm going to look there, up while you guys talk. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there are a few things I have to say. One of them is that you seem to be coming from a place that it's necessarily wrong and bad to use emotions to get people to a certain frame of mind, uh, and I would say. That's going to happen no matter what. That's just a part of the human experience. Uh, and I think that sometimes we as atheists do ourselves a disservice um, if we are trying to be Spock-like in some way, if we're trying to be just emotional, or excuse me, unemotional and logical uh, and, and try to make everything a learning experience or something about reasoning. I think that... Uh, you know, appeals to emotion have their place. Uh, I think that uh, people are not only persuaded by the facts, uh, and I think that it's perfectly all right to make some kind of emotional appeal or present something really beautiful or moving uh, as a way to present your position. Now, having said that, I also think that you should back up what you believe with credible facts and evidence, but you should recognize that they are, uh, you know, they don't have to be working against each other. Well, what do you think? <laughs> Go for it, guy on the phone. Oh, okay, Rowan. yeah, well, no, I, I really do appreciate your opinion there. Um, and I, I found it fun when I was taking the uh, science classes I had to take uh, that I, w I would end up being the guy in the team uh, doing the illustrations of, like, the cells and things like that. And mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was a fun, I guess, compelling <laughs> way to learn about the world. But yeah. um, I think that when I was in college and surrounded by other artists, I found that, uh, and this is just going to be maybe offensive to some people, but I was surrounded by people to whom data and facts really weren't really, it wasn't what they cared so much about, that it was really easy to stir these people uh, emotionally, and that yeah. that emotional subjective experience was more important uh, to them than, than, say, an objective data. You, you know what I mean? You should care about both. Uh, and I think that the people who are uh, disregarding evidence and logic and science are cheating themselves of a, you know, of a pleasurable experience and part of the wholeness of, experi of uh, experiencing what it is to be human just as much as they would probably say that people are cheating themselves when they don't care about art. Uh, Interesting. I okay. did find the example, and I, 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 yeah. I, I want to apologize because while I was looking for this, I wasn't listening to the conversation. So I apologize <laughs> right. if um, any of this is, is not uh, quite as direct as I had hoped. Um, this comes from, this is an excerpt from Joseph Campbell that I posted actually recently. And uh, I like this because it's a great example of the different ways in which we communicate realities through symbols versus communicating realities through just pure raw data. So he's going into an interview. I'm going to let him speak for himself. I'm going to read this um, excerpt. It's from some, a section called Thou Art That. 
Uh, and he says, let me begin by explaining the history of my impulse to place metaphor at the center of our exploration of Western spirituality. When the first volume of my historical atlas of world mythology, The Way of the Animal Powers 7, came out, the publishers sent me on a publicity tour. This is the worst kind of all possible tours because you move unwillingly to those disc jockeys and newspaper people themselves unwilling to read the book um, they're supposed to talk to you about in order to give it public visibility. The first question I would be asked was always, what is a myth? That is a fine beginning for an intelligent conversation. In one city, however, I walked into a broadcasting station for a live half-hour program where the interviewer was a young, smart-looking man who immediately warned me, I'm tough, I put it right to you, I've studied law. The red light went on and he began argumentatively. The word myth means a lie. Myth is a lie. So I replied with my definition of myth. No, myth is not a lie. A whole mythology is an organization of symbolic images and narratives metaphorical of the possibilities of human experience and the fulfillment of a given culture at a given time. It's a lie, he countered. <laughs> it's a metaphor. It's a lie. <laughs> this went on for about 20 minutes. Around four or five minutes before the end of the program, I realized that this interviewer did not really know what a metaphor was. Oh my God. I decided to treat him as he was treating me. No, I said, I tell you it's metaphorical. You give me an example of a metaphor. He replied, you give me an example. I resisted. No, I'm asking the question this time. I had not taught school for 30 years for nothing. Quote, and I want you to give me an example of a metaphor. The interviewer was utterly baffled and even went so far as to say, let's get in touch with some school teacher. <laughs> Finally, with something like a minute and a half to go, he rose to the occasion and said, I'll try. My friend John runs very fast. People say he runs like a deer. That's a metaphor. As the last seconds ticked off That's the interview, so I replied, That's that amazing. is not the metaphor. The metaphor is John is a deer. He shot back. That is a lie. <laughs> uh. No, I said, that is a metaphor. And the show ended. <laughs> what does that incident suggest about our common understanding of metaphor? Yeah. And I won't go on with it. He goes into some really great explanation about it. But the point is, there's different ways of communicating something that is real. Yeah, you, you know what that lie metaphor thing reminds me of? Uh, Galaxy <laughs> Quest just had its uh, 10th anniversary. What awesome movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, then uh, da damn it, you should. Um, but it is a science fiction movie featuring some gullible aliens who believe that this show that's like Star Trek uh, is real. And they base their whole civilization oh. around it. And then uh, when the captain, played by uh, Tim Allen, is finally forced to reveal uh, that he, you know, he was acting and it's all sets and studios all along, they're really upset and their whole worldview is shattered. But, you know... Galaxy Quest is itself a great science fiction movie, I think, and um, it really speaks a lot to the importance of having fantasy and make-believe and playfulness that's not all tied to reality. And I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a science fiction geek, more or less. Uh, I'm a big gamer, obviously. Not everything I... I enjoy for its own sake has to teach me a valuable life lesson or ultimately show me something about reality for it to be a good thing that sticks with me. Yeah, I, do, I wanted to add, there is one little quote in, in, within the same article that I really like. He, he says that after the show, he says, it made me reflect that half the people in the world think that the metaphors of their religious traditions, for example, are facts. And the other half contends they are not facts at all. <laughs> As a result, we have people who consider themselves believers because they accept metaphors as facts. And we have others who classify themselves as atheists because they think religious metaphors are lies. <laughs> and I think it's like a, a really interesting point that, yeah, it's, I think if we understood these metaphors as metaphors and these mythologies as mythologies and could accept them as transferring information about the culture, right? They do transfer information about the culture. This is why different cultures have different mythologies and some have similar mythologies because those cultures are similar or different. Um, and so those, those stories do convey meaning as far as giving you information about the culture, but how that meaning is conveyed is very different than just pure data.
Right, yeah. No, I, I can appreciate that a lot. I, I really like this, uh, what is it, Hero of a Thousand Faces? Is that, <laughs> yeah. Is that I, I actually like his interviews more than his books. I've read the book, you know, like about four of the books, and I, oh boy, I struggle with those books. But yeah. he, I do have the Bill Moyers um, interviews on, on DVD, and I love it. Yeah. Excellent. And so, I'm sorry, uh, Galaxy my, Quest must, have, must be having a 20th anniversary, not 10th. Yay. Man, my, I'm old. Uh, my thoughts on the matter were just that I'm older. Uh, art was an excellent means for showing something that was more like a subjective experience as opposed to an objective one, that uh, we experience things in a very array mm -hmm. way. And that sometimes, like Edward Munch's The Scream, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like that, they show how an experience feels rather than a photographic reality of what right. occurred. Yeah, and there's a reality in there. It's just about... It's it's not like you said. It's not fact. Yeah. You know, it's it's a conveying real information, but it's not conveying like factual data. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for taking my call. Sure. Okay, that was a great call. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. That was fun. It was fun. I had a good time. Uh. So that's it. That's our show. That's a wrap. <laughs> we're going down to. We're going to Threadgills North, and we're going to see you there. And. Thanks, Tracy. Thank I had a you. Really good time on the show today. Awesome as always. Yep. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>